So we made this slide just to spend one minute introducing new allergists that we have in the region at Everett Clinic, VM, NAC, and one in technology. Three of them we just graduated. One we're recruiting for UW faculty. If I've missed anybody uh, at other organizations, please let me know. Today's uh, the first presentation. Dr. Berkman is going to follow up where she started, talking about uh, ethics. Of and I made this a very uh, controversial topic intentionally. So the title is, Should Society Pay a Million Dollars or More to Treat One Rare Disease, Such as Skin, When We Fail to Provide Adequate Health Care to Underserved and Poor Children? So hopefully that's going to stimulate quite a conversation. Go ahead, Dr. Berkman. Great. Well, thanks again for having me back. And yes, I definitely hope that this stimulates a conversation at the end. So I'm going to try and keep my presentation slightly shorter so that we have time to have questions and discussion. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and let me know if you can see my slides. Everyone able to see them? Looks good. Great. Yes. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Um, so you heard the question that I was tasked with answering. Um, the answer is no, and the presentation's over. Um, <laughs> uh, I wish it was an easy question to answer, but um, as I hope to point out to you, I think it's a really complicated question that actually spurs more questions than it does answers, as is typically a good ethics question. So thank you for sharing this one with me. So I have no disclosures at this time, and I have three main objectives for you all. The first is just to become familiar with the different ethical theories that are out there, and then to appreciate the challenges in actually practically applying these theories to our real world experience. And lastly, I want you to be able to evaluate some of the competing duties that we have in patient scenarios as providers at the bedside. So the answer to this question is really, it depends. It really depends on which ethical theory you're applying and on which principles you're trying to prioritize. So we're gonna go through some of the main ethical theories. This is very much an ethics, not even a 101, because we're just gonna go over some of the very, very basic differences. Uh, but I think it's important to understand how I think through the rest of this question. So we're gonna talk a little bit about well, what the theory focuses on, and then what the strengths and weaknesses are of the theory. So the first is a duty-based or a rights-based theory. The ethical term is deontological, but we can just ignore that one because no one needs the fancy words. Really the focus in this situation is on the ethics of the act that you are doing. So your actions are right or wrong regardless of their consequences. And you are obligated to fulfill these duties and to act to fulfill these duties. Um, so this offers really consistent rules to follow which can be really nice and clear. And it also recognizes the there are role-related duties in society. So we as physicians have a duty to our patients to do everything that we can to promote their best interest and minimize harm, all the things that you guys are familiar with and do every day. But um, as you can imagine, sometimes there are conflicts, which is one of the challenges with this theory. So as a physician during a public health crisis, you also have a duty to provide the public with the best health possible. And so if the obligations that you have to one patient conflict with the obligations that you have to society, that can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, sorry, I don't know why my slides aren't advancing. Okay, um, virtue-based ethics. So really the focus is on who the person is that's taking the action. So what is the attitude, disposition, or character trait uh, that enables us to act in a way that develops our human potential. So that's a lot of fluff words, but really it's, are you acting because you are honest? Are you acting because you're trustworthy, because you have integrity? Are you faithful? 
if you're acting out of any of those, then you are doing the right thing. So the good thing is that this contributes uh, human excellence. Uh, the challenge is it's really, really hard to know exactly what we're talking about. There's really not a consensus as to what is an essential virtue and whether or not if you're acting virtuously and you have a bad outcome, that's still virtuous. So this is one that a lot of people write about, but I personally have found that this is a hard one to actually apply to real life scenarios. Consequentialist ethics is probably what you all are most familiar with. This focuses on it, the outcome of your actions. So the consequences of the actions or policies must uphold the well-being of all persons directly or indirectly affected, and you have to choose actions that produce the greatest overall benefits. So there are significant contributions of this type of ethical theory. Uh, it has direct attention at the end. Do you know the ends justify, do the means justify the ends? Uh, and then it considers the interests of all persons, which is really important. But there are some challenges. So this actually allows for bad acts. Uh, it says that bad acts are permissible if the end result is worth it. Um, and the interests of the majority can sometimes override the interests of the minority. And we also are bad at predicting outcomes. So we can uh, make our best guess, but sometimes we're wrong. So that's one of the challenges with this theory, but utilitarianism, which is I think more commonly known, um, falls within this big general theory category. So then there's principle-based ethics, uh, and you are all probably familiar with this as well, uh, because this really focuses on the context of the situation that you're in. Uh, and another uh, thing that we talked about, I believe last time is principalism. So these are the four main principles that we use in providing care for our patients every day. So we have respect for persons and autonomy, beneficence, doing good, non-maleficence, not doing harm, and justice. And so the good thing about this is it requires simultaneous consideration of all four principles and a balancing of them. And it draws on principles that we are all very familiar with, at least in the United States. But again, sometimes these, these can conflict, which causes challenges. And care-based ethics is the last one we'll talk about, which really focuses on relationships and the underlying power structures and situations. Um, and so it can provide a little bit of a counterpoint to the principle-based approach that we just talked about. Uh, and uh, again, it focuses on the big context. So, you know, maybe the situation is impacted because of a power dynamic, either because there is a, um, a hierarchy with a, a boss and a uh, employee or because there's a power dynamic in society uh, related to structural racism. All these things are kind of care-based ethics. So uh, it's really great to think about these relationships because they're important, but again, they're not always evident and there's not really a set rule to apply. And so again, it's not one other one of these where the, there's a little bit of wishy-washiness and so it's harder to apply in real life. So returning to our question, now that we uh, know everything there is to know about ethical theory, I think that we can really distill this very long question down into how do we allocate scarce healthcare dollars? Because that's really what we're asking. And when we talk about resource allocation, we are talking about rationing. Unfortunately, uh, the healthcare needs are limitless and the resources that are available are limited. Um, and even in resource rich settings, that is true. Uh, so we have to make difficult choices to allocate these resources in a way that results in reasonable balance across a large range of social goods. So if we met all of our healthcare needs and put all of society's money into meeting those needs, we'd have no capacity to pay for other social goods that are also incredibly important, like education and public safety. So some degree of rationing of healthcare is necessary for the overall well-being of society. But rationing may not always be ethically justifiable. So again, context matters. What resource are you talking about and what type of healthcare system are you working in? So an example is that you may have a rule that states that you have to try a less expensive, potentially less beneficial drug and fail that before you would qualify for a more expensive but potentially more beneficial drug. So that rule is easy to accept and justify if you're in a single payer system in which uh, the savings is reinvested into programs that improve the health of the population. But in a for-profit healthcare system like ours, it may be harder to justify uh, there's significant waste and the profits may not actually go back to directly benefit the patients. 
So rationing, I have this uh, World War II poster that talks about rationing and uh, you know, the fair share in healthcare is very different than the fair share of how many cans of food that you are given per week. And is it that everybody gets a certain number of healthcare dollars in their lifetime? Is it that everyone gets access to a basic level of care, which I think is again, what our question is getting at. But again, when we say basic, what do we actually mean? That's kind of a hard line to draw. And I think we all kind of have a basic sense, but then when you actually start to get down to the nitty gritty, it's harder. Okay, so basic maybe means access to, you know, preventative care, to antibiotics, to, you know, basic health screening. And then at what point does it reach into moderate levels of health care? We all kind of know what the advanced is and we know what the super basic is, but kind of the space in between is a little bit harder to understand. So in order to really talk about how we can ethically allocate health care dollars, we need to talk about distributive justice principles. So we've talked a little bit already about utilitarianism, where you're trying to maximize benefits overall at a societal level. So on the one end of the scale, you have $1 million that you're spending for one patient and that that can result in cure. And on the other end, you spend that same million dollars on a million patients, but no one's better off for having one dollar of health care. So where along that huge uh, spectrum is that balancing point, that point of maximal efficiency? And so that's actually where healthcare economics comes into play. So the economists look at two different things that they try and maximize. The first is quality adjusted life years. So the select outcome um, that measures a, uh, and adjusts for life years looking at quality specifically, and then you allocate your resources based on the maximum amount of quality adjusted life years available. But another way of doing that is through cost effectiveness. So you're trying to maximize healthcare benefits under budget restraints, and you're trying to find, again, that point at which you maximize the benefit and minimize the cost. So the bottom line from this slide is that no one person can be better off without someone else being less off. And that's just the economics of it. But another distributive justice principle is egalitarianism. All people are of equal moral standing and therefore all people should have an equal opportunity for a good outcome. And so this sounds great if we were on a level playing field, but it's a lot more complicated when we take into account this significant inequities that already exist in our system. So some ways that people have talked about uh, addressing things in an egalitarian way are a random lottery or a first come first serve. So I think uh, as people have thought about this more, a random lottery may still hold. It seems um, random because it is, but it's not putting value on one person more than another. Unfortunately, first come first serve, although it sounds like, all right, I mean, you have, if you get here, you get here. Um, is actually really not that equitable because people who live in more rural areas, people who can't afford transportation, uh, people who happen to already be there, that's going to really uh, not allow for an equal opportunity of outcome. So uh, I want to spend just a minute talking about the differences between inequality and inequity. I think it's really important because in ethics, our ultimate goal is justice. So inequality is as you already know, that there are unequal uh, opportunities that exist currently in our world for healthcare and for many other things. So if we were to equally distribute a scarce resource, like a ladder, you can see here under the equality slide, everyone gets the same height ladder, but that helps some people who were already in a better position and doesn't help people who were already in a worse position. So equity is trying to adjust the amount of resource provided based off of need. So if you're starting off from a worse off point, you get a higher ladder in order to reach the apples or in order to get the health care that you need. But ultimately the goal is this one in the corner here of justice, where we want to really fix the system, make the tree that's leaning stand up straight so that everyone ultimately does require the same height ladder. And so I think our goal would be to level the playing field so that we really can make these distributions on just a fixed number of resources. Uh, but in our current situation, we are far from that ideal. So a third distributive justice principle is prioritarianism, which is really focusing on the least well-off group. And least well-off has many different interpretations. So children are often considered the least well-off 
Uh, there's a concept called the fewer innings model where they've, they've been allowed to play the fewest number of innings in the baseball game. And so therefore they should be prioritized because they haven't had the same opportunity for life. Um, if you're a pediatrician like me, they're all children, so that doesn't really help you to prioritize. So what are some of the other interpretations of least well off? Well, it may be the degree of disability. Uh, it may be a low socioeconomic status. So I think the problem is, although this sounds really great that we lift up the least well off, there are so many groups that aren't well off that it's hard to uh, pinpoint one. And so maybe we need to prioritize all, but again, doing all these things simultaneously can sometimes result in conflict. The last is the rule of rescue, which is this impulse that we all have as humans to attempt to save those facing death, no matter how expensive or how small the chance of benefit if there are patient and they're in front of us. Uh, you know, some will say that this is related to the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, and unfortunately, it is at times at odds with societal level outcomes. So if you put everything into one patient, then everyone else is not gonna benefit as we talked about earlier and as the question really alludes. So, Although this is something that is deeply innate, uh, it is challenging. So back to making allocation decisions. How is it done? Who does it? What's the role of the provider? We're gonna get a little bit more into how it's done in the next several slides, but who does it is really important. And I argue that if you are the provider taking care of that patient, you should not be the one having to make an allocation decision because that directly puts you at a conflict of interest and a conflict of your duties that we talked about before. So if you are having to make allocation decisions for scarce resources, it should be done not at the bedside and not by the provider who has a duty to the patient. Um, and then what is the role of the provider? I think the role of the provider is that if you are the doctor and you have a patient in front of you, you are still obligated to do everything that you can uh, within the context. So in a COVID pandemic, uh, we've had a lot of doctors recognize that you have a patient who is on a ventilator who is on ECMO maybe and not getting better. They've been on for three or four weeks uh, and you're starting to see worsening multi-organ function. If you know that your patient is likely dying and that there are other patients who are critically ill and waiting, then you have to be the one to say, I think that this is not gonna work out well for my patient. And I think that we should shift to focusing on palliative care. But again, that's taking the whole context in um, and still having your primary role be the person at the bedside providing care for the patient. So in this example of a, a skid patient, you know, you should still be doing all the things that you can in front of you, but if there are concerns about how we allocate our resources, that should be done uh, at a separate time away from the bedside. But we'll get a little bit more into the ethical considerations for how these allocation decisions are made. The Institute of Medicine actually has a list of ethical principles for triage, which is essentially what we're talking about here. Uh, they require that we have a fair process and they have a very long definition. I won't read you of what they are defining as fair because again, that's a kind of hard word to understand in practicality. Uh, we have a duty to care for our patients. We also have this duty to steward resources like I was just talking about. We have to be transparent in how we make these decisions. We have to be consistent in how we make these decisions. And it has to be proportionate to the situation at hand. And then lastly, there has to be accountability and, and uh, oversight for how this is all playing out. And then these are some additional triage considerations. I think all of you are unfortunately quite familiar with a lot of these given the triage that's happened uh, with respect to COVID but you have to consider things like what is the degree of medical need of this patient and what is the urgency of need? Do they need it right now and they're gonna die or do they need it but they can wait several months? Are they likely to benefit from it? And what is the duration of that, that benefit? If they're gonna benefit, but then they're probably gonna die in a month, uh, that's very different than if they're gonna benefit and continue to go on and live a long, healthy life. What are the resources required? Are we talking about a one-time administration of a medication or a one-time transplant? Or are we talking about a prolonged thing that requires frequent return to medical care and frequent resources? Um, another thing that has been prominent within COVID especially is willingness to accept therapy. If you have somebody who doesn't want the thing that you're trying to allocate, then that's great. You should take that into consideration early. And then these are the more controversial ones that are left at the bottom here, but it has been mentioned and discussed. But what about social worth? Um, there was discussion early on in the COVID pandemic about whether or not um, physicians should be prioritized uh, if they got sick. 
Um, no one really argued that patient that physicians shouldn't be prioritized when it came to vaccinations, uh, but there was discussion about whether they should be prioritized when it came to triage of ventilators and other things. And the thought was that if you could recover a physician, uh, then they could go on, get better, and go back to helping to save more patients. So that's where a social worth kind of came in. And then we've already touched on first come, first serve, and lottery, so I won't belabor those points. So now I want to get into um, kind of comparison of patients so that we can apply some of these uh, theories and principles that we have discussed. So we have patient A uh, who has SCID and needs bone marrow transplant. Uh, bone marrow transplant is an established therapy, and so there's really no benefit to others. It would just be benefit to patient A. In contrast, we have patient B. Uh, this patient also has severe combined immunodeficiency, and by the way, I'm making all of this up just for the sake of discussion, uh, but they are offered an experimental gene therapy, um, and this may have the potential to benefit many other patients through its innovative nature. So the question is, is there a moral or ethical difference between patient A and patient B? So the question really is how much does innovation and potential future benefit to others matter in this situation or should it matter? And how about these patients? Patient A is a five-year-old, actually that's not right, let's say a five-month-old has severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, needs a bone marrow transplant, is a Medicare patient. Um, and so we put this into place and say, we are not going to provide these expensive therapies for rare diseases, so Medicare will not pay for a bone marrow transplant. And so this patient doesn't get the bone marrow transplant, and they try to maximally support this baby uh, using preventative things like uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Patient B is also five months old, also has severe combined immunodeficiency, also needs a bone marrow transplant, but uh, comes from a family that has more means, is in private insurance, or has crowdfunding, or whatever the case may be, and they're able to get the bone marrow transplant. So they're two five-month-old babies. They have ident an identical situation. We have made a rule that as society, we won't pay a million dollars for um, this patient to get a bone marrow transplant, but this other patient doesn't require societal funds. So is ability to pay morally relevant? And who really is society paying for? You know, society is paying for the least well off. So if we're not uh, providing uh, the funding for these patients, there's risk for just furthering the disparities gap between the haves and the have nots. So We've talked about a level playing field and about whether or not you can ultimately be able to provide the same level of resources to get people the same opportunity for outcome. And there are kind of two ways of doing this. You can level everyone down or you can level any, everyone up. And you know, the saying that we're not going to pay for an expensive therapy is in the leveling down. Whereas trying to find other sources of funding for basic uh, medical care that we're not providing to the poor and underserved is a way of leveling up. So there is loss, lots and lots and lots of uh, cost that could be saved if we were less wasteful in our system. Uh, so this is just an example that shows that, you know, Childhood immunizations are very cheap and they are very cost effective because they prevent really expensive illness. But if you screened every 35 year old for diabetes, uh, that's a huge waste of money. So going back to our question, have I answered it? Probably not, because I think that the path forward is still unclear. Some degree of rationing is inevitable, but reducing the need for rationing uh, really makes the question less relevant. And I think that's where the focus should be. So I would say that when we can, we should try and save money to care for those in need by preventing a wasteful um, spending in other areas of medicine. And if we need to, we can also simultaneously save money to care for those in need by limiting expensive but necessary treatments for rare diseases. Uh, but I would argue that we should start by trying to level up before we level down. So that's really what I had because I wanted to leave a lot of time for 
questions and discussions, but I really appreciate your attention and also would appreciate um, any evaluations at the end, but I'm going to um, escape my slides and stop sharing so that we can open it up for discussion. Thank you, uh, Emily. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. I, I would argue one of the problems with the analogy of even insurance paying for it is we society still pays for it because insurance companies are profit making organizations and they're going to spread that expense to the rest of society, uh, what they charge for other services. So uh, honestly, that that analogy doesn't work. Really, the only way that society doesn't pay for this is um, the family pays for it personally if they want to have this exotic and expensive therapy. Uh, otherwise, all of society continues to pay, no matter what the pay source is, if it's public or insurance. Yes, I mean, I, I definitely agree that uh, it's not the same as saying that there's no cost to society from a private insurance company. But I think that the point that you made about these insurance companies, about pharmaceutical companies, I think that there's a lot of reform and change that we could create in those areas to uh, really save the cost of healthcare because I think it's so expensive. I mean, so much of our GDP is going into this really expensive healthcare that doesn't necessarily have to be. And that's kind of what we talked about the last time is that if we could reform that system, that there could be significant cost savings and reduction, and that our money would be distributed very differently, and we might be able to provide care for the least well off much more easily. And then I think that um, if there wasn't such a discrepancy between the people who are in need of basic health care and the people who are getting expensive bone marrow transplants, um, it wouldn't feel as, as um, tenuous as it does right now. One thing I asked you before was to discuss how other societies deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, did you look into that? I did. Um, so one of the cases, I don't know if any of you are, have followed or are familiar with the Charlie Gard case that took place in the UK several years ago. Um, if you're not, there was a, a little baby who was born there with a very rare genetic disorder. Um, and he essentially lost a lot of his um, neurological function. Uh, and there was a very, very highly experimental therapy that was potentially available. Um, and in the UK system, it's a single payer system. And so the family had appealed to get access to this. And the UK said, we're not going to fund this. So if you come up with your own um, sources of income to pay for this, then, you know, we would maybe consider it. So the family took a long time to, to raise the funds and they did. And unfortunately, in the time it took to raise the funds, the baby got worse. Um, and then they still wanted to uh, pursue this and the UK said no. And there was a doctor in the United States who said that he was willing to still continue with this procedure. Um, the long and short of it is that um, the UK prevented the family from flying because the baby was too sick and felt like the courts needed to intervene for the baby's best interest. Um, and um, there were a lot of discussions about healthcare resources because although the court question wasn't about healthcare resources specifically, this whole question about what they would and wouldn't pay for made it so that the baby was in the ICU for many, many, many months incurring really high costs. And so this question came up about, yes, the, the UK health system put a hard ceiling on what they would do and allowed for families to pay for expensive therapies out of pocket, um, but that in doing that, they ended up potentially using more and more healthcare dollars by prolonging the time that the child was in the ICU and needing ICU level care. So there's been a lot of discussion about um, truly whether or not the, the hard ceiling on what they will and will not do for, for really expensive therapies um, is actually saving costs, if that makes sense. So um, there is a hard limit in the UK, at least, for some of these things. But if it's experimental and it's part of a research protocol, then it's uh, not part of the ceiling. Um, 
Other comments or questions? Do we have any of the immunologists who treat these patients on the line with opinions? You hear me out there? Yes, no? Oh, and I, you know, I think this is, this is probably one of the most controversial topics we're ever going to get into. Right. And, and unfortunately, it's not just with babies. Now we're dealing with it with intensive care unit decisions. So it, it, the, the trickle effect of ethics is becoming more and more blatant and in our faces every day. So it's one thing to well, think about I mean, the experimental yeah. treatment, but then... It, it, it's the experimental stuff is for the theoretically for the benefit of mankind that some of this other stuff is that's different. Well, I mean, here's a parallel question. You were offered a COVID vaccine, which is a life saving therapy. You chose not to get it for whatever reason you got sick. Um, is it our responsibility to take care of you in the hospital when you turned away a simple, effective therapy that could have prevented all of this for, I would argue, totally irrational reasons. And does our society have enough money to handle all of this? It's a really great question and really yeah. timely. There's been a lot of discussion among ethicists about whether having declined the COVID vaccine impacts your triage and impacts whether or not you get access to these really scarce healthcare resources like ICU beds and ventilators and ECMO circuits. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who think that the right thing to do is to say, you didn't take this life-saving opportunity and therefore we owe more to the person who followed the rules, took the COVID vaccine. And a lot of people who I think want to use that as a, a way of helping to make these really def difficult decisions that we're having to make. Um, the counter argument is that um, unfortunately in certain situations, there are um, more valid concerns behind the vaccine. Um, and those oftentimes fall in groups of folks who are already marginalized and already at higher risk for bad outcomes. And so there has been a lot of discussion about you know, if you are a, a BIPOC uh, person uh, or, you know, someone who has not done well with, uh, you know, experiments and has not been treated well by the medical system, that your hesitancy in getting a vaccine is different than somebody who is, you know, declining it because they're worried that a microchip is going to be put into them. Um, and so some people have not wanted to use that explicitly as a part of the triage. Um, I will say that, you know, because I, my other job is that I work in an ICU and so I'm seeing this a lot. Uh, you know, kids don't have access to the vaccine uh, a lot of times, or if they don't have access, or sorry, if they do have access, it may not have been their decision uh, to not get it. Um, and so for me, I don't have to deal with this on a daily basis, but my adult colleagues, I know feel very strongly that um, if they're faced with the decision of one ventilator left and one person who got in the vaccine and one person who didn't, they're going to want to provide it to the person who did. Um, so there has not, there's been a lot of debate happening and I'm not sure about whether any of the hospitals or um, states where they're actively triaging has implemented that as one of the decisions. Um, but a lot of people feel strongly that that is something that should be considered. Well, also these decisions by people who are re refusing, actively refusing the COVID vaccine or denying essential health care to people with other serious diseases. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been examples of people searching for a, uh, a surgical procedure or an ICU bed or people dying because yep. they couldn't get health care because someone else was taking up an ICU bed and a ventilator. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty obvious from my comments where my opinions lie about this. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the COVID pandemic has forced these decisions to the forefront. These are not idle decisions anymore about one kid with skids. It's about all of society mm 
Um, specifically, when I was asking you questions about other healthcare systems, I mean, what happens with things like, uh, you know, primary immune deficiency being very expensive in Sweden or Canada or the UK, or I was just in Iceland, a very nice advanced society, it would seem like normal people as opposed to us. Um, um, I, you know, I apologize. I don't know the Iceland's uh, approach to things. Uh, I kind of looked at the, the UK um, and kind of their model. And I think that they, um, again, are supportive of these more innovative things that they hopefully will um, see benefit to many, many different patients. But I don't know specifically about um, Iceland or Canada. There's a, there's so, there was a paper that I found that didn't really differentiate between the single payer systems. We we'll have a, a big silent audience out there. Anybody else? I just have a question. So this is a little bit more, I guess, everyday experience, but um, you know, what is the I guess, ethical thought about determining costs of therapeutics? So, you know, you and, and what what people or payers will cover, um, because you know we face on a day to day basis decisions between different drugs that one might be covered, might be not. One might be more expensive for a patient, one might be not, um, or these new drugs that come to market for like or HAE patients that are $300,000 a year and who determines the cost of that, you know? So how, how are these prices determined ethically? And, and then when you look at like inhaler coverage for Medicare patients and compare our costs to other, other countries, like how are these costs determined in, in our society? And, and, the, and where is the, I guess, the ethical dilemma in that cost scenario? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good, really big question. I mean, I think that uh, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of ethics uh, folks who are involved in these decisions, and I think that um, the, there's a lot of health economics that goes into it. But again, you know, I think last time I talked, we talked about the example of um, treating SMA and that there is one that requires intrathecal administration of a medication, and it's you know three hundred thousand um, dollars per year as opposed to a two million dollar one time medication that is a gene therapy. Um, and the, uh, I would argue that it's not really ethical to have either one of those options be as expensive as they are because it's so prohibitive that you know people are either going to not be offered it or are going to um, be completely and totally financially devastated uh, moving forward if they have to pay for things out of pocket. And, and the other thing was that if you had Medicare, you didn't get access to financial support. And if you had private insurance, you did get access to financial support, which is just totally unethical and wrong. Um, but for these, um, for these more expensive medications, you know, the, the economists will look at it and say, well, over time, the two $2 million one is cost efficient because it's a one-time $2 million charge and then they're, they're cured. They're not in the healthcare system. And that's way better than coming in every year for these $300,000 options. Um, so I agree. I can understand that it's cost effective, but I don't think that that fully encompasses the ethics of it. And so, you know, I think that um, there needs to be more done to limit the cost of these medications uh, so that we're not having to, to make these decisions. And as I said in the presentation, you know, I think that there's a lot of changes that need to occur within our current system in the United States because of the fact that we um, have these highly profitable pharmaceutical companies that are charging these astronomical costs for drugs, um, while at the same time, we are so wasteful in other areas of medicine. I mean, I. Um, in the ICU, we are using things that are really expensive all the time. And I don't know that up until COVID, honestly, that we did a good job of really thinking through the cost of a lot of the things that we're doing. And now I'm trying to use that as part of my daily teaching and discussion with the residents and fellows that come through is, you know, IV tubing has significant costs, all these things that shouldn't cost what they do. And so I really think it's um, a bigger um, issue with with how healthcare works in our country and and how the incentives work for pharmaceuticals and insurance companies. <laughs>
I know that didn't really answer your question, but you know, I, I think it's highly problematic and, and I don't have a very specific uh, recommendation for how to change it at the moment, but I know that it needs to be changed. Thank you. You know, these really strike me as not our decisions. You know, if, if you go to an emergency room with a, a routine medical problem, the first thing you have to do is give me your insurance, right, when you're checking in. It's the same thing really is true of this situation. They're going to helicopter in a three-month-old kid with skid. The decision really is on the admitting end, like what's your insurance to pay the bill for this? And if you don't have any, do we accept you? Once the patient's in the hospital, you, the, the decision's been made. Society's gonna pay the bill for this. Mm -hmm. I, it's not a medical decision anymore. It's a bureaucratic decision. I don't know if they're thinking ethics at all or they're thinking money or thinking at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, when, when the patient's in front of you, you're going to take care of the patient. That's kind of what we all do every day. Um, and I don't know that the appropriate people are the ones that are the gatekeepers, if you will, to who gets in and who doesn't. Um, you know, we, again, I'm just going off of my personal experience in pediatrics. Uh, you know, we're the biggest ICU for five states. Um, and oftentimes the decisions of who comes to the ICU and who doesn't come to the ICU are made by other people in the hospital who don't have the clinical knowledge that we do. So the MDs are not part of the decisions for who's accepted and who's not, which has bothered me for a very long time because we're the ones who know what the patient's going to need, how they're going to benefit, um, and we're not part of those decisions. So you know, there's, there's the ethical obligations that you have of a patient who is physically in front of you. And there's additionally legal um, things too, you know, EMTALA is that you have to stabilize and take care of the patient in front of you. And if you're not going to continue to provide care for them, you have to find another place that will. And kind of once they've been accepted into the medical system, I think no one would ethically feel okay booting somebody out who's in need of care. So I agree that these, these decisions are oftentimes made um, not by the care team or the physicians, uh, and that that's a, a very strange and backwards way of approaching things. Um, and again, I think if we had a predetermined set of rules that we were going to be able to apply, you know, consistently across hospitals, across states, um, it might feel very different and we might know what we were dealing with. But when it seems so up to the luck of who the person is, what time of day, you know, what people are feeling like, it, that's just where there's a lot of unfairness that can enter into the system. The COVID pandemic has highlighted this and really thrown these decisions right into our face when, you know, the ICU is full and there's no room for you and go search for another hospital. It's just sort of highlighted the tremendous inequities in our system. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Anybody else out there want to have a strong opinion Len. like I do? Len, this is Vin yeah. Vinod here, Vinod Swami. You know, I had a question. So, you know, I think, you know, one was related to COVID. Like, you know, I think I'm fairly agree with kind of the sense of what you say is um, with, um, you know, just like, you know, one of, one of the things is, do you provide care, or not provide care? That's a tougher question once you present to the hospital with COVID. But, you know, if you're somebody who is refusing the vaccine, just like you'd say, you know, you're a smoker, you're a higher risk, you know, is the, does the insurance company or do you pay in some kind of penalty or a surcharge or a premium extra? Because just like what Delta Airlines did is to say, you know, you pay extra for your insurance. You know, is that is that a disincentive? Is it something that, you know, why is it that not being, you know, kind of considered more widespread from a sense to say? you know, you're a smoker, you're more likely to have cancer, you probably pay higher premium. Now you didn't get vaccine, maybe you should consider your premium is going to double up, you know, in a sense of month to month. Yeah, I, I mean, would I agree think, with that. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, and I think that disincentivizing not getting vaccinated um, is definitely something to try and do. And then you know, I think 
as is oftentimes in the news, really trying to dispel any of the misinformation that's out there so that people aren't making these decisions based off of really poor and inappropriate information. And unfortunately, there have been some physicians who have been sharing some of this misinformation too, which is highly problematic. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion as well within the ethics community about the, the moves that have recently been made uh, to you know, punish physicians who are sharing this misinformation about the vaccine not being good and um, ivermectin being helpful. Um, so I think it's you know, disincentivizing uh, not getting the vaccine and also um, having the physicians who are not doing their job, doing their duty as physicians to you know, protect their patients that they also need to be um, getting in trouble for that. And that's just my personal opinion about that. You know, there's always going to be bad actors in any field. I would, I would suspect that would not have the, they had their own, you know, point of view and their own incentive to do certain things. And so I'm condoning what they're doing, but I agree with you, like, you would expect there would be somebody like that. Just a comment. Definitely. I think that there's, um, as this has drugged on a lot longer than people expected, and as this continues to be a problem, I think that rules are going to change and people are going to be a little bit more forceful in how they approach vaccination. Um, I know that uh, at least at, at Children's, you know, we've had older patients who've gotten really sick and been on ECMO who could have gotten the vaccine but didn't. Um, and again, if, if you're under 18, the thought is that even if you didn't get it, it was probably not fully your decision. Um, so, you know, we are not going to change our approach to that. Um, but I do know that in other adult facilities, they are considering um, that if you don't get vaccinated, you are not prioritized for access to an ICU bed and other things. And I don't disagree with that at all. I had a question again related to ethics, you know, of uh, trying to how to decide, you know, of course, there's so many variables, it is always hard to decide. But you know, I, I have a scenario one to say it's like you have, you know, a 60 something who has a short term serious illness requires ECMO or things like that. And, you know, but the extended ICU care and the costs associated with that and the 60 something who has been productive his entire life, you know, who has contributed to society, and now still has some years left and the amount of cost, you know, that's involved in the treatment is one scenario. The other is you have a five month old, like, you know, you have somebody who has not had, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not using skid, but, you know, I personally, when I was doing pediatrics, I took care of a child with Pompe's disease. And I'm very familiar with, you know, at that point of time when I was doing my training in the nineties, of course, Pompe's disease was, you'd say, you know, I don't know if things have changed since then, but you know, quite in early 90s was like, you don't have treatment for it. So you, you know, you quite naturally, you, you know, in the first year of life, you die of, you know, pneumonia or something, but you don't intubate or don't trick, you don't, you don't trick the child. But of course, in the 90s, Duke started, you know, experimental enzyme treatment for Pompe's disease. And, you know, of course, there was a rich family in somewhere on the West Coast who was, who had kids with Pompe's disease, who, really was, you know, you know, involved, you know, did a lot of crowdfunding across the country and collected a bunch of other children with similar disease to kind of help support legislation to provide enzyme treatment for kids with Pompe's disease. And it so happened that nine months old, this other ch you know, child got trachea had tracheostomy, of course, you know, the most often kids with Pompe's disease die of, uh, you know, respiratory failure. And now that you have tracheostomy, it's like, you know, you have a completely, you know, I, I guess quadriplegic or completely paralyzed child with relatively normal mental system, kind of, uh, you know, bedridden on a tracheostomy for the rest of life, reading 24 hour nursing care. And, you know, the cost of what, what we cause as treatment is one time cost, but the lifetime cost of what that is towards the entire lifetime were plus the productivity part, you know, the factor of saying how much they actually can contribute to society, you know, in terms of it's always, you know, how do you factor that, those things in a sense of cost? It's not a one-time thing, but a lifetime. No, that's a really great example. I think it brings up a lot of those um, ethical considerations of triage that we were talking about. So, uh, you know, likelihood of benefit, duration of benefit, resources required. So for the 60-year-old, you have um, a high likelihood of benefit. You have um, significant resources required, but for a finite period of time. 
Um, and so both of those things would speak to providing the service to that 60 year old. Um, the thing that would go against the 60 year old versus the five month old is that uh, prioritarian argument for uh, the fact that you should prioritize the youngest because they played the fewest innings and they're the least well off. Um, but again, if, if most of your arguments fall under support of the 60 year old and you have one argument that goes for the five month old, then, then you know, depending on the ethicist that you get that day, they, they may be more in support of the 60 year old because again, like you point out, it is still somebody who has quality of life left, who is a productive member of society and who may have a finite period of significant resource requirement. Um, the five month old, <clears throat> like you said, is gonna have you know, a lifetime, however long that may be, whether it's five years or 20 years of really significant high cost medical needs, home nursing, all the things that you're talking about. And so in terms of um, you know, likelihood of benefit, we can keep them alive um, and then this becomes a value issue of like what you consider quality of life versus what their, their family considers quality of life for them. So the economists would definitely say quality adjusted life years would be better for the 60 year old than the baby, but the family's obviously gonna have their value of what they consider quality of life that you need to kind of take into, into consideration. Um, and I think that the big question that this brings to me is that just because we can do something doesn't always mean that we should do something. And um, in ethics, I think people have a, a really hard time because again, there's that you know, rule of rescue of like, we can do this, we should try this. And sometimes you need to have that moment of pause to think about the bigger context, like you guys have all been doing and ask about you know, the ethics of it. And so um, you know, I uh, do organizational ethics because I'm trying to think about these things on a system level as opposed to an individual patient level at the bedside. Um, and I think that um, there are oftentimes things where just because we can does not mean that we should, um, but we have to be really thoughtful about how we set limits when we say no, and we have to be really consistent and transparent about it, because if we're not transparent about the reasons behind it, then it's going to cause all sorts of problems. And thank you for answering your question. The reason I bring it up is, you know, these things don't happen at the same time. You know, of course, one's pediatric, one is, one, one is adult, you know, you're not weighing on that given day, that exact scenario, what to do with that five month old versus what to do with the 60 year old. And of mm -hmm. course, pediatric adults are so the two different teams kind of weighing this, weighing this uh, question apart. So in the context of mid decision making from the ethics team is like, you're only looking at that particular individual in that time and you're not really comparing best case scenarios for other individuals who could be in similar scenarios and could be better off. So you know, it, you know, and given different hospitals, given different, you know, institutions, you'd say the, the approach to that, you know, how, you know, how do you, how do you merge or how do you can, how, how do you do that kind of on a global scale where you can think about these scenarios and not apply to that one individual case when you're making the decision? Right. Let me ask you a, a very pragmatic question. We have a department of medical ethics. We have you and other do we actually use you in a productive way? Do, do medical hospital administrators come to you and say, we have this patient in Montana, they want to fly over here for X, Y, and Z therapy, which is going to cost the institution $10 million. Is that our responsibility? Do, do you play a, anybody in medical ethics play a day-to-day -day pragmatic role in making an, giving answers? That is a great question. And the answer is no. Um, my, one of my personal goals is that um, I, we are starting this organizational ethics program, which is not the clinical ethics consultation that you might request for a specific patient scenario that's already in the hospital. Um, but I, I'm trying to get involved in a more proactive way of, um, you know, helping to make these really challenging decisions that healthcare systems are facing all the time. You know, not trying to say that I will always have the answers. That's definitely not my point. But I do think that having somebody with an ethics background at the table and making these really important decisions is really critically important and is not something that I think is done routinely in a lot of different hospital settings. So there's this new um, kind of movement behind organizational ethics, which I hope to be more of a proactive role rather than a reactive role. But thus far, I have served in more of a reactive role. Um, and, and a lot of the decisions uh, that have been more proactive have actually come out of COVID, that they're now trying to think ahead about how we triage our resources and things like that. So we, 
fortunately in pediatrics have never had to implement it, but we were uh, part of making a, a triage team that involves people not actually taking care of the patient so that the providers aren't the ones that have to allocate the resources. They're just supposed to take care of the patients in front of them. And the case is reviewed by another group of people who have knowledge of the disease process and ethicists to help figure out how to make these triage decisions. So that's been probably the most um, uh, productive, proactive role that we've played to date. But that, as you say, is, is definitely the goal that I'd like to have ultimately. Well, unless we have any other questions, thank you very much for tackling this uh, very difficult subject at a difficult time in our society. Yeah, thank I'll, you for I'll, bearing with my non-answer to your question, but uh, well, it's really I'll, I'll give you my an, my answer to the question is no. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It is. It is not society's responsibility. Yeah, I think we need to be really thoughtful about how we try and make the changes. But you know, I think that we need to make sure that we prioritize providing you know good basic health care to everyone before we start doing these expensive things for everyone else. Any last comments? Otherwise, we're going to adjourn. Thank you again. Thanks very much for having me, everyone.